Hello there, Sir from 17 once again. This is my Evil Within 2 Nightmare difficulty. No upgrades, no keys, and no damage. This is chapter 14, it is burning the altar, and uh, in this part of this church, or this stronghold, there's going to be a ton of bottles to pick up if you need them. I recommend them, they can be useful. And there's going to be some gunpowder and some other things to pretty much help you get back on track after all the ammo you might have spent in that last section. There's also going to be a herb. Never use the herbs. I'm assuming you can use them to make healing items, but I've never done it, so I can't uh, guarantee that. Be careful in this section. On Xbox One, this section crashed a lot for me. Um, I don't know why. I got a, a whole host of crashes in, in late game Evil Within 2. I'm hoping that they patch the performance for that, because the game is a really fun game. I like it a lot. I just wish that certain things were a little different. And one of them is the performance. It really is. If you play this on PC at 60 frames per second, with the wider FOV, you're going to understand just how much more fun of a game it is to actually play. And there's a lot of people that are of the mind that when you play survival horror games, having wank controls and crappy camera speeds and an inability to see what the fuck is going on and where you are is in somehow an endearing term and is in somehow enriching the survival horror experience. And I can understand that. But fundamentally, don't you want to be able to be a capable player of a game? Don't you want the game to feel fun to play? To actually feel like you're in control rather than just a mess? I do. So, as much as I enjoyed my first playthrough being all tense and scared and tentatively moving through the game, every playthrough after that, I want the game to work, and I couldn't give a single fuck about horror, because the horror's done then. I know where the enemies are, I know what the spawns are, there's no more surprises, the game's just gonna be mechanical at that point for me. So, to me, the PC version is the only way to play this game, because it's, it's one of those things where I would have incredible difficulty going back. And I'm going to play a lot more of the Xbox One version, but I just know it's going to be fraught with me thinking that I should be playing on PC. And it would be really nice if you could sync up saves between consoles, because I would love to get all the achievements on this game on PC, and then just use a USB, drag it across to my Xbox, and unlock it all on there. Because I don't want to fucking play a horrible version of this game running in 29 frames with a camera up my ass and the aiming feeling like shit. You know, the version that I've made this walkthrough on feels amazing and I wish you could touch it just to understand how great it feels because when you compare it to console, it's a joke. It really is. And I get no pleasure from shitting on the consoles and it's all I seem to do these days because they're just inferior PCs and it's really sad. And there are games that come out that are fantastic ports that have got wonderful features that enable you to feel in control and have a lot of fun. And then there are games that aren't. And in 2017, should we really be getting games that are running at sub-30 frames per second? I don't think we fucking should. If you can get Uncharted 4 to run at solid 30, everybody else is really not performing as they should be. And I think that's what's most ironic about Neo coming to PC. Neo is one of the only games on the PS4 that actually fucking runs right. Like, <laughs> of all the games to pick to come to PC, as much as I'm happy about it and I can't wait to play it, you want to pick the game that doesn't work, right? You want to pick something like Bloodborne, that runs like complete garbage, that could be so much better if it had consistent fidelity. And instead, you know, we get the game that ran fine on PS4, and only had a few hitches, whereas a lot of the games are really in need of the extra power, and a lot of them aren't even supported by PlayStation Pro, which seems kind of disgusting, really. Because wasn't it part of the contract for game developers that they had to, if they were going to make a game, it had to have this mandatory PlayStation 4 Pro upgrade? But they've also, they've always had stuff like that, right? Those stipulations that you have to do very specific things, and then the developers don't. Can you remember when achievements had to be a set amount of things, and then they ch and then people didn't do that, and nobody batted an eyelid? All these stipulations and rules, and nobody gave a fuck. Always very strange. But this is a really interesting stealth section, and it's interesting because it looks really intimidating, and it's actually really easy. But it must be said, folks, it's also very random. Uh, earlier on in the walkthrough, I mentioned a section where when I twist a crank, I move through a corridor, I flank around the right hand side and then I go up the stairs and I'm done with the zone and it's dead easy. This is that section. But in this walkthrough for some reason, I had a hell priest all of a sudden decide to have an infatuation with coming through the doorway that I needed to use. And I've done this section maybe 10 times and it never happened. But on the one time I died a few times on a bad pattern and boom, he would not leave the doorway. 
So what you're going to see here is a really aggressive manner of getting through that door. Because once you're through that door, you get a save point, and the enemies don't follow you up the stairs anyway. So you can literally just run for it if you're confident. It, it works really well, and it's exactly what I'm going to do, because as I move up here, normally, you would execute this next dude, and then move out the door and carry on, but look who's there! Why the fuck is he there? He's never there! Ever! Except for this recording run. And he always knows where we are, because he's full of bullshit. So, I run back on myself this way, and then from here, I'm just going to push through this central room and run straight for the opening. I'm going to do a bit of a circuitous route here so that people have to, you know, try and chase me and do goofy things. But, for the most, this is, like, this couldn't be easier. There's a couple of fire dudes and they're quite intimidating, but they all have to scream before they do anything, so they're fundamentally not threatening. And look at that. I didn't even have stamina and I got through that room. What a joke, right? And then the door shuts and the enemies walk away. In my first playthrough, I had the sexiest path through that room, because the Hell Priest wasn't there, and I just moved through that door, I hugged the right-hand side of the room, I went over a walkway, and I walked past everybody without being seen. And then, of course, on the walkthrough, it just doesn't work that way. So, once again, folks, games are random. Shit like that can happen. If that happens, you have to improvise. Hopefully, you can take what I've done there, use it in your own gameplay, and just get through that section. But that is one of the rooms when I was first there. I thought that room looked intimidating as hell. Fire guy in it, fire everywhere, tons of enemies, not really sure what I'm supposed to do. And then the moment you pull that lever, you get that checkpoint, you're like, oh, this is going to be easy. And then you just run through the door. Piece of piss, right? But this section is great. I really like this sequence coming up. This is a section that really reminds me of classic Evil Within and it combines what I like about the stealth and what I like about intimidating enemies. So, this entire next area is going to be a bunch of flame guys all patrolling around slowly, completely engulfed by little lost people. And we're going to be moving past all of them without incident and then getting to the end and getting a, a lovely checkpoint. But once you come in here, you're going to have access to a mirror. Feel free to save if you want to. Uh, entirely up to you. Feel free to do some crafting. There is a sequence coming up where you're going to need weapons, but you get to craft before it, so it's not the end of the world if you don't. But this is what I ended up doing. So, Supply-wise, we're not doing too bad. Our ammo is low. We don't have many shotgun, we don't have many sniper. That's the two things I really want. But as far as tools for our crossbow, we're doing just fine. We've, we've got a nice, healthy selection. But this next room coming up, if you play on survival, it doesn't have the flame guys, and I feel like it's completely pointless. Because it's so cool. You pract you're sneaking around chain link fences and crumbling mortar, and there's flame guys walking on the other side of these fences, like scanning the place looking for you. And it feels really tense and really cool. It's just a really great section. And it's got a lot of the homages to the first game with the shooting the valves and the fire and everything. But in here, I think you can rush this door immediately because this Hell Priest freezes himself. And I think while he's frozen, you can just sprint and kick that door and you'll be fine. But I haven't tested it, guys. It's just an idea I got while I was recording. Because he's going to stand here and flame that way. And I'm going to move to his right while he does this. And I'm going to go through here. And for whatever reason, this guy has a very tough time following you. Uh, be careful here, though. If you sprint like I did, you're going to set off Mr. Flamey there. And... Uh, Mr. Flamey has to do his little fanfare, and I'm going to bottle him and stab him in the throat. So, um, pick up the shells off the desk, that is a really nice part of this path, and then open this door. When you open this door, you're going to see a massive plume of flame. This happens every single time. This guy does extended blast over here, just to show you that he's there. And then he's going to walk slowly past this pipe, he's going to turn up there, and he's going to start walking towards that corner. And when he does this, there's going to be a bunch of lost that are going to fan out. And what you want to do is you want to wait for the opening to follow the lost guy that goes where the, the, the Hell Priest came from. So, as he turns around here, don't follow him too quickly because he has a fantastic ability to turn around randomly and know exactly where you are, even though you're crouched. So be careful of that because he can hear through all your bullshit, apparently. So just wait for him to walk a little bit and then disengage cover, and slowly follow him towards where those pipes are, to use those pipes as cover. Be careful of that as well, he's little cast a glance this way. But there goes the doorway. One guy's gonna walk there and stop, other guy's gonna walk to your right, and then one guy's gonna go up. 
So we want to follow the guy who's going up, but we need to wait for this other dude to go back where he came from. The moment he turns around and starts walking, we start walking too. And if you follow this correctly, nobody should see you, nobody should follow you, and you are completely immune. The only thing you're going to have to put up with is this guy who is in front of me. And what we're going to do is we're going to shoot a valve to get rid of the flames, and then we're going to throw a bottle at his face and stab him in the throat. Because we're nice people. Uh, but you can stealth execute him if you want to, but that runs the risk of moving back that way, and I don't want to move back that way, so... I pop a bottle on, I play really aggressively right now, there he is, being all flamey. And he's going to come down here, keep shouting, keep screaming, his little pantomime is all considered, and then we're going to throw a bottle at him. So there you go, friend. Bottle in the face, slash that throat, and then you can go and touch this, this, this cranky wheel thing, and rotate it at your own leisure. How cool is that section? That pattern, as soon as I figured that pattern out, it all flowed so wonderfully naturally, and you don't even have to engage anybody except that last guy. And even then, you might even be able to avoid him if you're patient enough, but I don't have that kind of patience. And then we have this. A fight against three Geminis. So I tried a few interesting things here. There's a, a freeze canister at the back of the room if you want to use that, but I don't recommend it at all. Instead, uh, how this is going to work is simple. If you have three shotgun shells, you can instantly kill the first guy, but you need to wait until you shoot him. Wait for his animations to activate before you shoot him, or you won't do any damage, I don't think. So if you wait for him, he's going to go into position, and then he's going to back up. Watch. Now he's vulnerable. Shoot him there, shoot him again, and then shoot him a third time. Then you want to put on your smoke crossbow, and then from here what we're going to do is we're going to smoke our feet. And I don't exactly know how many seconds you get with the smoke, but the idea here is neither of the other two Geminis will enter the smoke. They'll come close, and then they'll run away. And in the moment that the smoke dissipates, you want to fire at your feet again. And you can get through here using, I believe, two smokes if you time it well, but I might use three because I'm a little bit nervous. But the door's going to open, and then you can just run up, and you don't have to fight those other two people. And the price there is smokes, right? And look at it like this. The next boss coming up, the smokes do no damage to them, they just give you an opportunity to shoot them. And you have freeze bolts which do the same thing, and you have electric bolts which do the same thing as well. After that, there's no real bosses where you're going to be using smoke on, because it's unnecessary and it doesn't help against the final boss. So, there you go. You know, it's a good use of smoke bolts, and that's not even mentioning we can now craft them and get them back if we have the ability to do so. But unfortunately, I don't have any smelly powder, so I can't actually do it. But in my mind, having shotgun shells and wasting smoke grenades is a victory, and that's why I think that that strategy is really, really good. But you can fight them if you want to. Stun them, three shotgun blasts, stun them, three shotgun blasts, and, and be done with it. I just feel like... Smoking is the best way to go, kids. So, if you want to look cool, smoke. But here is the room that we were in before it pushed us out in Chapter 9. This is actually the, the blood pit that we were stood in while Theodore was stood on his little perch up there. And you can choose here to just continue on through the doors and trigger the boss fight. Or you can go down here and get one of the resonance and pick up... I'm not too sure what you get to pick up. I think it might be gunpowder, so it might be worth your trip. But we're on the video now where I can finally talk about the next encounter. The next encounter is a boss gauntlet that is a 100% homage to the bosses in The Evil Within 1. You're going to do a quick time event to kill the Sadist, then you're going to have to fight three Keepers, and then you're going to have to fight Laura. The Keepers are intimidating because they're Keepers, but they do not take half the damage they took on Akumu difficulty, and you're going to be able to kill them really easily. They're, they're actually really big bitches, and I was massively surprised. I thought they would be very difficult. I was quite worried I was going to use all my ammunition, because I was comparing them to the fight against uh, O'Neill. But it turns out O'Neill is just a boss that is incredibly tanky to begin with. So my strategy here is to kite the first keeper around the room, picking up the sniper rifle ammo that they give you, picking up the shells and everything that they give you, making sure to grab as much of the resources as you can, and I'm going to use all my harpoons on this guy, and it's going to kill him. So if you have, I think, six harpoons, it will kill the keeper. That was me hitting him with the axe. I think I hit his, uh, his backpack and it didn't count. So that might be why the, uh, the axe was a piece of poo-poo. But uh, suffice to say, I saved the axe through the hardest part of the game in hopes of using it here, and then I used it and it didn't seem to be very effective. But maybe if you hit him on his chest, it's way better. 
But that's the end of the first guy. And now there's going to be two keepers spawning. If you get lucky and you pick the right keeper helmet, you can do spawn shotgun shots and you can shoot all three shells into a keeper and it will put him really close to death. From that point onwards, he will not take much more damage. It's kind of ridiculous how easy these guys are. And if you've done the end of Evil Within 1 where you fight two of them on a Kumu difficulty without using the upgrades and the keys and everything, then you already know just how ridiculous these enemies can be, but you're already really comfortable with fighting them because you've fought them in a considerably more difficult game. Because as much as I like this game, it is nowhere near as difficult as the first one. The first game is considerably more challenging. And I'm hoping that they patch in an extra difficulty, because limited saves is not difficulty, developers. It's just tedium. You know, it's really silly. So all I'm doing here is showing you the uh, the, the reload cancelling ability of the crossbow to swap bolts. And then I'm hitting these guys with something to stun them, and then I'm hitting them with something to do damage. And I'm putting this gun on because it's shit and I hate it. There's the first keeper dead. And then we just have to kill this guy. And now it's one on one, so he shouldn't give us any problems. And I'm going to use the pistol for this. And now I can just run around picking up all the stuff. So grab as much stuff as you can. Don't go down into that corridor there without realizing it's a dead end, because that's the only way you can die here by getting stuck in a dead end. And feel free to, to just have a nice little stroll around and get all the stuff that you can. Understand that the keeper can do a lot of really fast running moves, but if you know how they work, he'll never touch you with them. And uh, keep on shooting him with the pistol to finish him off, because he's not worth anything more powerful. He's a bit of a bitch, actually. So there's the stun, and there's the kill. There you go, double keeper fight down. Now we have to fight Laura. So if you killed two of the Harbingers, you will be able to get a flame tank, and you'll be able to kill Laura with the flamethrower. I've never done it. Uh, I saw Darkseid Phil do it. And it worked pretty effectively. It seemed to take two bursts. I'm going to be doing it for the people who don't have the flamethrower. So I'm going to be turning the valves on, and then I'm going to be setting her alight twice. And the trick here is when you start turning the valve, if she's at a distance from you, she'll generally spawn into that body that you can see in the central area there. And that's all we're going to do. We're going to move away from her. She should never catch her if you understand how she moves. She's nowhere near as good as she was in the first game on Akumu. On Akumu, this bitch could get you in all kinds of interesting ways. It was very challenging. But in this game, it's easier to, to not get hit than it is to, to get hit. Like, you have to try to get hit by this boss. It's really just a cinematic moment. But get some space from her, get your stamina back, and then go back to the switch. And then when you start turning the switch, if you see her getting inside the body, you can continue to do the full switch because she will never ever get to you in time to kill you. So watch. She starts teleporting, you'll see it go pink, and all you do now is commit to the switch. And every single time I've done this, she's got close, but she's never been close enough to catch me. And then all we need to do now is to pull her into the center, and then pull that button twice. And it's really simple. It's even easier than the keepers, and the keepers were a joke. So, there she is in the middle. Hit that flame. There's the first deluge of fire. Pick up the shock bolt. You do not have to smoke her, or shock bolt her, or anything like that. She will, by her own commission, go into the flames. You just have to circle this area, get back to the switch, and, and dunk her again. There she goes teleporting. You don't even have to sprint. Your normal sprint is enough. You'll notice I'm doing the tap sprint there as well. And there you go. That's the end of Laura. Exceptionally easy fight. If you're having problems with it, you're probably not as well versed with the enemies. But just practice and you'll have no issue whatsoever. Thank you very much for watching. And as always, you take care now.